listed a series of questions that I hope we might talk about over the course of this uh, discussion. And this really will be a discussion. Uh, just as a preface, what kind of inspired this was Najib was talking to me about some of the things that we're doing at the University of South Florida, one of which, of course, is our DBA program. Uh, our DBA program was different from traditional academic programs because it was classified as a cost recovery program, which means that every time we use a faculty member, we have to pay for the faculty member. Every time we do uh, a classroom, we have to pay for the classroom. The whole idea of this is the, pro the program has to break even. It's not allowed to lose money or make money. And this is one of the reasons we have so many accountants in the program, because we, we, we need some very creative accounting to, to break even uh, like that. Oh, fantastic. So, uh, but over the years, I've also talked about some of the other things that we've done. Uh, for example, in my department, we have something called practice centers, where we basically create a consulting uh, arrangement with our whereby uh, a, a business will pay our department $15,000 or $16,000, and then they'll get a team of students who will work on a specific problem for a semester under the guidance of a faculty member. And uh, we treat that as a grant, and every semester now we have somewhere between five and seven of these things going on, great for the students, great for the faculty. Uh, and great for the business, as it turns out. Some of these practice centers have been extraordinarily successful and have delivered way more value than we charge for them. So, with that as a kind of a context, maybe we ought to step back and talk a little bit about how entrepreneurship in uh, an educational setting is different from just business as usual, because in a lot of educational settings, faculty are so isolated from the economic consequences of what they do that they don't really necessarily think like entrepreneurs. Uh, you constantly hear faculty members complaining about their class size, but you know, a business faculty member, uh, a full professor might make between $150,000 and $250,000 a year, and he or she basically feels that no class should have more than 15 students, and the students are paying uh, you know, $300 a credit hour. So basically, so, and, and, and yet somehow that's okay, and they only want to teach uh, you know, one and a half classes a semester. And so being isolated from the economic consequences uh, is a little bit different from the world of being an entrepreneur. And so when we start talking about educational innovation and entrepreneurship, I think it's, it's sort of interesting maybe to start by talking a little bit about what we mean by entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. And, and uh, Gail here is, is actually a, a real honest God entrepreneur, as, as are many of the folks uh, uh, in our program. And I was hoping you might want to just start us off. But you see, he got cold call. That, that'll teach you to do something. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. 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 That was yeah. his yeah. room in space. Yeah, you want to start us off just talking a little bit about what what you mean when you talk about entrepreneurship. Okay, sure. So one of the things I've noticed, and I, and I observed it throughout this conference, and it actually had me smiling, is that folks that aren't fixated on the term, who don't see it as an area of study, on, constantly interchange the noun and the verb. Entrepreneurship is actually not the original writings of the Wealth of Nations, but it was, it's the translation from the Wealth of Nations going back to 1748. It's the fourth factor of production. And I always found it curious, interestingly enough, when I was 23 years old, or, or 22 years old, and I was sitting in the USF library, at first I was gonna argue with Mr. Smith because he had labor and entrepreneurship, I said the same thing. And then as I read his book, I realized that he understood that, that was a process, and it was a role, or it was a procedure, if you will. But if you listen to the, the, the folks talk, in fact, earlier presentation today about uh, uh, how to improve SMB circumstances, they often confuse entrepreneurship roles with entrepreneurship, the process. In there. So what I want to accomplish is I want to help academia and government over time understand what that process is and how to help it benefit the GDP, society, culture in general, and or maybe even start to understand the elements of it that they can't help, because I am very much a free market theorist as well. 
So there are some elements to entrepreneurs that are part of their spirit, God-given, if that's your faith, or whatever your choice might be, uh, 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 was it uh, nurture versus nature, natural. And I don't, I, I don't think you can, you can uh, necessarily just create an entrepreneur. Plus, I don't think there's such a thing as an entrepreneur. I believe there are types. What, I asked the question earlier about creativity. Um, I know tax accountants um, who are not creative, but they're entrepreneurs. They run their own enterprise. They bought a building, that's their land. They hired some staff, that's their labor. They put their own capital in. Maybe they got money from a relative, that's their capital. And they show up every day and make all that work. So they meet the standard of Adam Smith's uh, uh, fourth factor production. And then we know fellows like the gentleman who runs Tesla, or you think of Steve Jobs, who are clearly creative geniuses and visionaries and motivators. So there are grades or types or degrees that I, I believe is actually pure entrepreneurs. I believe there's hybrid models. And then I think there's entrepreneurs of necessity. I made the joke earlier, the professor, you show me a consultant, I'll show you an unemployed guy. Because in, in, in the States, when we don't have a job and we don't want to acknowledge that, we just become consultants while we try to find a job. So so there are types or flavors of them. So is that a big job? Well, that, yes, uh, but, but what I was, since we've got a very interdisciplinary audience, many of whom are not from business, maybe you could talk about what you actually mean when you use the term entrepreneur. In other words, what distinguishes an entrepreneur from a normal business person or a normal faculty member? The entrepreneur is the individual responsible for the coordination of the other three factor productions which create a product, part of the gross domestic product, to create that business's uh, capability. They're, they're the initiator, they're the fuse, um, uh, and that they're the firing pin, if you will, that kick off the other three activities. The other three activities are dependent upon the role of the entrepreneur. If you come to place land and capital, and labor won't meet on its own accidentally and organize itself. The entrepreneur initiates that process and becomes the change agent over time and continues that process. Okay, so initiates process. The the labor function. This is more about the motivation and the, and the passion and the drive to the vision. And to initiate the process, he or she should be willing to do it, to fill any function, including sweeping the floors. So you said initiates, and then what was the other thing? Initi initiates the process of coordinating the other three values of production. That's the point. They gather the land, labor, and capital and cause them to become a unified team or have a purpose. Okay, and so so initiates and then sort of organizes at the, uh, uh, organizes at outset. What is the role of the entrepreneur as the process continues? Uh, in other words, once the process is initiated and organized and, and the uh, entrepreneur coordinates it, what, is, what happens to the role of the entrepreneur? The, the, the change agent or the stimulus or the ingredient as the business goes through its cycles of strategic planning, as the, the business evolves, as it evaluates its SWOT and makes changes, uh, the entrepreneur is that change agent that causes to have the strategic manager. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, okay, so this gives us a sort of a common vocabulary for what we're uh, talking about. Uh, yeah, Jeremy? Just to be a little bit interdisciplinary about this and remove it for a moment from the world say, identify the chief characteristics that you have about having the initiative and the ability to coordinate and everything else, let's apply it to a non-economic area and see if we can find entrepreneurs in other areas <coughs> using that term. We can go from one, take one term, use one discipline and apply it to the other. So I'll apply it to say to some an academician, apply it to an archaeologist, or another scientist, or whatever, and say they in the right, given the quality of the words you just said, they could be entrepreneurs. So you made my point about interchanging it. Entrepreneurship, right, right. as an economist, is a factor of production. It's not so, and it's designed to grab the other three factor productions and create a profit and stimulate an economy. But that's not so if we do a non-for-profit activity or we're doing, if we're doing intrapreneurship and mm -hmm. how it works in academia, then you're into society's definition of a, of, of a, of a hybrid role, if you will, but not into the economic definition. Yeah. And, you know, you know, truthfully, if you actually think about, uh, you know, say a university setting, uh, you wouldn't normally frame it this way, but, you know, in, in a certain sense, uh, you're coordinating labor, which is other faculty members, you're coordinating capital because you have to deal with budgets and you have to deal with inflows and outflows, and 
lab, a lot of universities have trouble with classroom space. I mean, so it doesn't have to specifically apply to business, though that's where the term originally evolved. evolved. Now, what, I'm, what I'd like to do, if we have some uh, 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 people here willing to volunteer, uh, I'd like to get some examples from your own experience of things that you considered entrepreneurial activities that occurred in your own context. And we'll use, since we're focusing on academics here, let's focus on academic entrepreneurship. I gave a couple of examples, like our DBA program, our uh, practice centers, but I'm sure that all of you have some interesting examples, and I'd like to just include some of these here so we can talk about them a little bit more. So, can anyone give you, give me an example of something sort of entrepreneurial that you felt happened in your institution? I would like to insist on the psychological requirement, necessary requirement of entrepreneur. Okay. I insist on that because it's different to intellectual skills. It's a psychological skills. <coughs> if you got to initiate something, by definition, you are alone at the beginning. So you need to do any kind of function, even if you don't know it, you have to write, uh, to, 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 to read a book for dummies, you yeah. know, to, to, to try to see what you're gonna do. I mean, uh, there is a psychological trait, there is psychological skills that's extremely more important than any intellectual skill that you might have. And this is what was explained, in my opinion, what uh, Peter Drucker said, that in his experience, innovation <coughs> and entrepreneurship are extremely related to culture. Because in, now, adding to what Peter Drucker said, I would say that it's your culture that provides you in the initial stages of your life, the psychological characteristics and the motive that you have to lead. Because if right at the beginning, someone is insisting in your achievement, something is insisting that your achievement will be your family achievement and you have strong ties, strong family ties, that would facilitate, that will increase the probability <coughs> of effectiveness of an entrepreneur. So what I'm seeing over there is okay, but it's the objective part. I would insist in the subjective part <coughs> as related to the culture you receive before the aim of self. That doesn't mean that you cannot change it. I'm not saying that it's not changeable. What he described is because versus it's the culture. only way to explain what Peter Drucker said in his first, the, the first book written on that, about innovation and entrepreneurship. I find no other way to explain what he said. Okay. Entrepreneurship is a term I first saw in Dr. Whelan's text, which <coughs> describes individuals who want to be entrepreneurial life. But to his point, when you started in a university setting, there's capital, you've got a job, you've got safety, you've got access to funding. What you didn't do is wake up, get out of bed, and go pick a spot to go work, pay rent, sign a lease, buy tools, some strangers walking by, hire them and put them to work. There's some sort of pre-built structure. And so entrepreneurship is something that kind of launches off of entrepreneurship or off of the initial <coughs> second generation, or it's a synergistic event of an entrepreneurial activity. Okay. Just take an example. I would say that Cochise, Taking right out of uh, Najib's statement, Cochise, the warrior of Southeast Arizona, was an entrepreneur. Took land. He had obviously a concept of a land. He certainly took his work <coughs> and he took whatever resources he had to fight the cause. I would say that he was an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I, uh, we're we're definitely uh, we're definitely moving. Uh, Certainly, <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead, Nathan. I'm, I'm trying to build on what Najib said, and, and maybe what Najib's talking about is in.
contrast to skills, which I think we talk a lot about. Um, we link the word entrepreneurial with skills. That he's talking more about intention and, and attitudes, right? And and it's the it's the intention behind the method to become entrepreneurial, or or I would use the word entrepreneuring a lot more than entrepreneurship because it would remind you that it's process. Um, so so then it's then what we should be exploring is what what creates this intention and Ajit thinks there are cultural uh, aspects of this, no doubt, that happen really, really early and that we may need to overcome them or we're in a better place. You know, I was I didn't get a chance to ask uh, Dr. Feinstein about to respond to this, and maybe you guys could, because I think part of this attitude of entrepreneurial, entrepreneuring uh, relates to having a creative attitude, a creative attitude. And there's a physicist uh, who's at University of Chicago named John Rader Platt, and he wrote about creativity, and he said there are three things that stoke your creativity. One, the people that you hang out with. I think we agree with that, right? Our colleagues who you hang out with to your notebooks. So it's what you are writing down about your evolving self. I write about 2,000 pages a year, and then I go to Montana for 10 days in December and reflect upon the year deeply and see my process. But the third one was the pearl for me because the third um, attribute to Platt is audience. And I thought, wow, there's the pearl. So I tell my graduate students, we're all busy. And if you're going to go someplace and give a canned talk, the same talk you gave someplace else, stay home. Because you have stuff to do. But if you're going to allow the audience to then force you to see where you are and what are the relations that are on your mind and the hierarchies in your head, then it doesn't matter how busy you are you got to go do that talk because it's one of the most important ways of sparking your creativity. It forces you to say, here, I understand this much, here's my experience, and I have to frame it into something current. And I think that that's really, I don't know if you've ever read Pla uh, uh, John Rader Pratt before, but uh, um, that's, that's really well, and your talks are a really good uh, idea about that because you're the only person I know who creates slides on the fly while presenting. I mean, it's uh, it's it's fascinating to watch, uh, and that is, uh, you know, so I think so. I think the creativity process is a big part. I guess go ahead, Matt. I wonder, if, you know, we're trying.
in the real world. But the reality is, is what an entrepreneur is, is somebody who generates the three factors of production for the purpose of a profit, mm -hmm. and it ends up benefiting an economy, mm -hmm. which is usually associated with a country. And everybody else wants to enjoy that label because entrepreneurs can have celebrity status, but much like athletes do. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't want to be known as oh, Stephen Jobs? Even with all the negative connotations you hear, overall, loved and respected. Who wouldn't want to have been Henry Ford? Who wouldn't want to be Oprah Winfrey? When you think about world-class uh, entrepreneurs. Who would want to be, I would want to be, Walt Disney. I, I would trade, that was probably the only life I considered trading my own for. Disney, I thought, was amazing. And folks so much want to be entrepreneurial life that they try to morph what they're doing into this definition. And it just simply creates a, a confusion and a bias when you start to try to study and understand it. But, but isn't that a bit narrow? Yeah. Isn't that a bit narrow and biased? I mean, you know, and I, because I, and I gotta bring this up, because when, when you, when, when you, Myself, I gave myself permission. 
I used my money and I did it. And I didn't have any of those other pieces. And that, that is the psychological state that, that he's trying to drive to. There are certain people that will make something from nothing. And there are many people that will make something better from something. And that's the difference between but an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. An entrepreneur, well, we're, we're getting nomenclature. Again, I'm not, I think people get defensive because they think being an entrepreneur is not as good. It's like, you know, well, we want to be equal. Okay, in fact, we'll make entrepreneurs better because they usually take small businesses. Entrepreneurs are usually very bad at what they do, but they're good at starting things. And how many times do you hear the story about they then hire a great CEO who then comes in, or a great CFO, look at Nadi, who comes in and fixes the business and makes it very efficient. Entrepreneurs have the unique skill of starting something from nothing. Entrepreneurs have a skill of taking something, even if it's very little, and making it into something very great. So in, entrepreneurs need entrepreneurs if they're going to tip on to the next level, if they're going to if they're going to grow their business. But the they're not the same thing. One of the things I wanted to do, though, and raising that example, is I think terms can be used in an ideological fashion. And what happens is that you color the term with various ideological components. Now, the reason why I raise this, I'll raise it again, is that, first of all, I'm raising in a culture that really didn't uh, have a sense of uh, private property. But I'm taking the analog, and I'm taking the psychological process of somebody who started out with nothing, basically almost no land in the chair of power mountains, and said, God damn it, we're going to take this land, take the land that is ours. So you start with nothing. And you have that psychological thing taking the land, obviously, that the product is going to be more the land coming getting the land back to where it belongs. And then you basically had the labor, obviously the warrior, and the capital, whatever, the weapons, and blah, 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 blah. So I can I can give the analog. When I, the whole point of this thing is, is I'm trying to break out of the ideological mold, mold rather than have a, a monologue of this has got to be this and applying these specific economic terms. If, if, if I may uh, interject for a moment and, and attempt to take control of the conversation for just a few minutes, which is unlikely to succeed, but it's worth, it's worth trying. Uh, I, you know, right now we're dealing with very abstract definitions of terms, and I, my experience with, with faculty in particular is when that happens, we could go on for hours with a very satisfying discussion and absolutely no resolution. Uh, what I would like to do once again, and I'll try this one more time, is to actually get some examples of what people think. Because I, I tend to realize, I tend to start with examples and then try to generalize from them as opposed to starting with principles and then trying, well, whatever one does with the principles. Uh, uh, so, uh, I was confused. He, did, he is confused. <laughs> well, and I'm I really, I really confused. Let me give you two examples. Okay. According to what he said, uh, what you did is intrapreneurship. What the people who created the university, Kaplan University, they did, and entrepreneurship. Both of them are academic. But in your case, it's intrapreneurship, and that case. In that case, it was entrepreneurship. But both of them require the same psychological skills and risk taking. Different risk. They're, they are risking money, but he's, he's just risking his prestige. Uh, yeah. Well, fortunately, that was that was risking from starting from a very low point. So I'm not I'm not sure there was that much to risk. Uh, but uh, the. Uh, not getting hung up on the terminology. If we could just get some examples, because because this is going to be a very depressing discussion if nobody's got any examples of what they considered innovative. Well, but I'm looking for examples. I'm looking. For, well, Kaplan University. Okay. I mean, I that's starting a university from the ground up. It's certainly. Uh, uh, but but I, I was actually looking for people's own university. Give us an example. My first company was Turk Tigers. Go ahead. It was a lawn care and maintenance business. And we started fertilizer, which we call tiger droppings. And okay. people would pay too much for it with that wonderful label. So. Okay, <laughs> okay. But, but can we do this in an academic context? Please yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. In, uh, in Nigeria, the federal government saw a situation like this. And they observed that a number of students are uh, graduated each year. And Quite a number of them who are graduated do not find a job place in the market. Okay, so so they felt that 
you were the ultimate control just for the yeah. whole entrepreneurship <laughs> education in the in the school. Okay, so let me let me just start. So this is entrepreneurship education in Nigeria.
creation of words and from that angle. Yep, and that and that's very similar to what Gil uh, Gonzalez was saying about this notion of essentially coordinating land, labor, and capital for profit. I mean, basically, what you're talking about is creating wealth through this desire to move forward. How do we have? Here, please go ahead. Well, well, uh, all this discussion about the products leads the question: uh, What are the universities for? So, do we have to? Are we responsible for technology transfer to the industry? I think yes, and this exactly is the model in Germany. Because we created uh, a foundation, it is called Steinbeis, it's just the name, Steinbeis Stiftung, the foundation, where a lot of uh, professors from the universities are entrepreneurs with uh, projects uh, which are offered to the industry for exactly this technology transfer. And uh, the goal of that is that we could hire students uh, during their studies, study programs or after them, and uh, they, uh, so to say, are embedded in the project, uh, working with the professors for industrial uh, uh, project and industrial uh, development. So, for example, my, my transfer center is working for uh, information technology, designing websites and whatever. And this is the first experience for the students with industrial uh, thinking. And I think it is so important. And so this led to the question, is the university responsible too for this uh, technology transfer or not? So is this the individual, or do we have to create a system to do that like the standards? Who are the top decision maker and makers in this organization? Sorry? The top decision maker of this, uh, this organization. I am, because I'm the entrepreneur. So I'm responsible for that, what I'm doing in, in my, well, uh, um, uh, well, it is like the industry, like like a, a small business. And I'm allowed to do that because my, I signed a contract with the Chancellor, and I could do that uh, where, when there is no no uh, problem with my, my uh, task at the university. I signed that, and okay. so I'm the entrepreneur for, for exactly this business, my own office, and I'm responsible you for the You don't have well. any academic boss? No, it is Okay, that's it. That's the that's way. I, I, uh, that's the way, if you have an academic boss, <laughs> or the principal of the university it was ever, uh, it's gonna help. I have heard you talk about uh, the organization that you uh, founded in Venezuela uh, for consulting. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that sounded very entrepreneurial. Yes, when he says Venezuela, someone would stop listening because what's happening to Venezuela, you know, everything is bad. <laughs> so I was told, well, yes, that there is a positive side. If this organization uh, could, was not destructed yet by the regime, does mean something. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean? So there is a positive and negative part of saying that this is Venezuela. Okay? So what we did uh, over there, and I was told that mm, in Europe, uh, almost no university did that by the second president of the of the, uh, of, of the foundation that we did there. I was told that one month ago. This is why I asked you who's taking decision there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what we did there, and it was not easy, is to create an organization, non-benefit non -benefit organization, that would provide consultants and professors and uh, people who can do solve real life problems to the industry. I mean, to link the university and the industry. But this organization cannot be decided by academics. The, the, the chief executive officer should be someone not for academy, or if he's from academy, should have his own business and his own consulting firm that survived at least 10 years. The reasoning 
was and still is that the best professors are not necessarily the best decision makers. Some sometimes are the worst. I can imagine, anyone of you can imagine Einstein as an entrepreneur? No way. No way. A CEO? So, so you're, you're no way, I mean. Incompetent executives and we're gonna, you said we're gonna leave incompetent. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, the important thing right. was, <laughs> the important thing was is the decision makers, the top decision maker should be completely independent and autonomous from the university. Otherwise, it will be another foundation as the many we have in Venezuela that didn't work. So it worked because the revenue of the university, the largest uh, revenue of the, of the university, Simon Bolivar, after, of course, what is what the university is getting from the government, the largest revenue has been for 27 years what this foundation is providing to the university. So it was not providing a complement of the salary of the professor because the salary down there are done. So it solved a lot a, a problem of many professors, linking them, you know, to, to to the industry. But at the same time, the percentage that was gained, that was retained, was the best revenue the university had, the first one after the government. And don't you see well, how, how you, you say for se 27 years? And it was this is why I asked you who's deciding there? Okay, well, just, just first to remark uh, to give you an, an idea about the style by step of your journey. I estimate uh, the budget, the yearly budget of about 280 million euro. And you could imagine that uh, when you have money from the industry develop something, you are free from the administration in your university to do that. And this exactly is the goal. So you are independent from your own administration and you could do that, you could develop something. And you could be innovative, you could be creative, and so this exactly is the technology transfer. I, I, I Before the Chavez regime, the, this foundation I'm telling you about, used to have a revenue of about uh, 100 uh, million dollars before. But now with the Bolivar devaluated, it's not, you see? So, uh, uh, and it was a huge, and it was one of the, uh, the largest in Venezuela and one of the largest in Latin America. But the, 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 the thing was how to convince the people about what we are doing. Let me give you just an anecdote, a small anecdote, quickly. The scientists from physics, from chemistry, from mathematics, all of them not just opposed the idea, but they were enemies of the idea. Enemies. And six months after I was told everything that I was corrupting the, the academic system, one of the guys told me in a meeting, I don't care if Najib Kalaos, you know, is corrupting the academy. I care when the dean that is you is corrupting the academy. <laughs> so I said, why do you think I'm corrupting the academy? He said, dirty money. He didn't say dirty, he said another word. <laughs> you are giving a commission to people to find projects. I said, hey, if he's a chemist, if he's an electrical engineer, and he saw the demand for a mechanical engineer. He cannot work on that project. But if he gets the 10% of the project, he can give the project to the mechanical engineer, and then the mechanical engineer can work, he can get his 10%, and the university can get his percentage in order to provide additional grant to you. Then he said, I don't need grant based on corruption. I said, but why, why do I say it's corruption? 
He said 10% of commission, that's corruption. So the Lord eliminated me. And I told him, you have a book, a very good book in physics. He said, yes, I used that book. It's a very good book. And I was not, uh, I was telling the truth, okay? I was not sarcastic. He said, yes. I said, I understand that your book is used almost in, in many places in Latin America. He said, well, yes. I said, but you have uh, a royalty. He said, of course, but that's different. I said, but you're having a royalty of 15%. Yes, Professor Kraus, but that's different. It's a royalty. We are talking here about commission. That's corruption. I said, well, you produce books. He produced information systems that are being used in the industry. He used that, he produced projects, systems. So let him have royalties on the project. He said, well, royalties on the project is something different, <laughs> not an issue. <laughs> this, this is just an anecdote, okay, which tell you how hard was it. <laughs> then after that, every uh, scientific department all of them agree, and the organization went by unanimity of all the departments of the university, unanimity in the academic council and in the general council. So to achieve this kind of agreement in a university, my experience tells me is nothing easy. Well, in fact, that raises a good, uh, I think, a next topic that we're going to talk about. And I think I'm going to start using the term innovation now instead of entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, <laughs> so that we don't, so that we don't end up necessarily uh, uh, continuing to debate terminology as much as I love to debate terminology as an academic. It's right. but, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when basically, this is how we, this is how we kill time in academia. We come up with two people who have slightly different versions of the same term, and then we debate it. <laughs> that's, you know, and that's what we're paid for. But, uh, but at any rate, let's talk about some of the barriers to innovation, because everything, everything Can I say, I with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <There's always laughs> yeah. I mean, there is a huge intersection between the concept of entrepreneurship and innovation. And yeah. sometimes this, uh, innovation is a necessary condition for entrepreneurship and vice versa. Yep. So I, I would not conflate that both concept because... Uh, well, I'm not trying to conflate the concept. I just, I just want to talk about innovation because yeah. I think there might be more consensus. So you know, it would be the first time I've been wrong in this crowd. But So uh, you're proposing to talk about innovation but not to talk anymore about entrepreneurship. Well, well, the two overlap. Please go ahead. I disagree with you. Uh -huh. I think you can still be an entrepreneur but not be an innovator. Yes, that's what I said. No, no, it's no, an intersection. I, I said an intersection of the two But I'm saying not necessarily. Somebody determines there's a need for bookkeeping services because there are a lot of businesses. They open a, a tax, tax business or bookkeeping company. They're not innovators. They're just providing a service that's required. Yeah, this is the part that is not the intersection of you're referring to. I said intersection. That's right. Well, so it's not the Okay, so we'll do what we'll say, okay, uh, innovation and entrepreneur and, and what we're actually talking about now is this thing over here, so we might even, uh, but what they're talking about is this intersection here and then there's this thing here where there's entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and stuff like that, well I won't put entrepreneurs over here because I'm wearing it, but there, let's talk about this area right here, uh, because what we're really interested in now is finding out, talking about, you know, barriers to innovation in education, because ultimately this we're focusing here, in fact, the title of this is Educational Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And, and, and believe me, I, I think I, I know a word that I might have changed if I were pretending that. But, but anyway, let's get back. So 
what are some of the barriers that we encounter when we're trying to innovate in an educational context? And let's particularly talk about higher education here. You know, K-12 education is, an, is a different Money. challenge. Go ahead. Money and the amount of colleges in the country. Money? Yes, the number of colleges. Now, why is the number of colleges uh, a barrier to innovation? What makes, what makes that a barrier? I'm curious. I just don't think that it's exactly a barrier. I think it might be good because uh, college must survive from two positions to have money for funding. And if college doesn't offer something new in their curriculum and they are trying to work with students, then students will not apply to college. So maybe it's good mm -hmm. that they so, so in a sense, this this represents competition. Yes. So now this is this creates a, a rather interesting uh, thing to look at because if you think about it, uh, on the one hand, uh, an ed email high institution, can you survive? Uh, well, okay. As an educate as a higher I'm, education, I'm, I'm gonna make a hyperbole here. Oh, okay. The money is not what is required. Is what is blocking innovation in the universities. Because if we didn't have money to pay salaries to the professor to keep the academic standards that we have in almost all the university, we will have possibility to make innovation than to make an innovation with all these people that are being paid in order to keep the promotional structure of the university allow any kind of innovation, that avoid any kind of innovation. So the money is being used in order to, to block the innovation, the kind of innovation. Depends on what kind of innovation we're talking about. There's, there's innovation in certain areas that are, there's, they, you can make innovation, there are other areas in which innovation and near impossible. So it depends upon the area. I think we ought to qualify it. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that uh, uh, the chief makes an interesting point because uh, uh, certainly in dealing with faculty, and I don't know how many of you have encountered this in your institutions, tenured faculty who basically know that their salary is going to be the last thing the university will cut. You know, first they'll cut travel expenses, then they'll cut adjunct faculty, then they'll cut janitorial services and so forth. You know, basically knowing that you're at the, at, you know, your salary is more secure than just about any other salary in the university is certainly, uh, does not create a huge incentive, financial incentive to change necessarily. <laughs> It's the inverse situation. It's right. great incentive not to change. Well, that's okay. So, so in a sense, uh, we're saying here is that the job security, the yeah. job security of the tenure faculty that uh, that we need to do this uh, do it uh, tenure. Yeah. No. Well, but I, 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 I will not. I, I, I will not understand the yeah. tenure. Well, Tenure professor, yeah, the professor to, 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 to and to get to find out they should do what the tenures are telling them to do. Okay. Well, we have multiple conversations going on, and I think this is an interesting question. Uh, uh, Lynn had said uh, that basically, if a tenured professor is making uh, a guaranteed salary and has nothing to lose, why shouldn't he or she want to? Do things on the side, you know, make more money. I mean, it's 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 definitely not the risk profile you have when you go out and you start your own business and put your last peer dollar pressure. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. That's the thing. Peer pressure. But wait a minute. Because, but wait a minute. But wait because minute. It's it's for some reason, many professors feel allergy to the world of consulting. It's allergy. Get it a peer pressure. Well, and, and, and why do you suppose that there, why do you suppose there might be this peer pressure? Why, why do you think faculty are allergic to consulting? Or some of them are. Mm -hmm. some. 
I mean, what? The promotional system, the promotional mm -hmm. structure. Okay. The silos, the disciplinary silos. Okay, the silos, okay, so. Silos. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Uh, the, one of the things, um, and we talked about this a little bit in the consulting discussion that we had on the first day, but if you take a look at the way academic structures develop, the people on top of the structure have, have reached the top by behaving in a certain way. And that is how they've achieved success, and now that, that is how they've achieved status. Now, if you've achieved success and status in a particular way, and someone comes along and says, okay, well now we're gonna start giving credit for behaving in this other way, it's a threat. It's a threat. It's a threat. What, does that do to, what does that do to the sort of implicit pecking order within the department? We should be doing a SWAT area in the Well, <laughs> strength, Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. The strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, trust. We can do that next. I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense as to what people are encountering in their own institutions. Uh, so certainly there's the existing status quo. Go ahead, please. Well, for example, at the University of Cardiff, there is now a trend that you, as you can be tenured, or you might be on fact, which might be not in review with you, for five years you would use yep. new course, a new project, where you really mm -hmm. didn't, like engineering schools, they have certain requirements to finish some projects, and how science, they have, they have certain requirements, and with the specialist schools, how science, I do know that most recently last year, they hired three new faculty, not on tenure track, not the, on five years contract. So what this is people now, this is new faculty, definitely do something more innovative. So maybe we need to eliminate uh, tenure. Well, interesting question, and there is a sort of an assumption out there that once people are tenured, they stop doing work because they don't have the kind of... Is there any evidence that that is the case? I, yeah, go ahead. evidence for that, but I think it, it fits with this, what I would call, ruts of expertise. Yeah. When you develop your expertise and you grow in your stature and and then you talk, you want to create lifelong learners, but then you yourself are kind of stuck. Yeah, I, and I think, so So in a sense, well, one of the things we might be talking about is essentially ruts that people get into. In other words, you basically you get into this pattern of behavior. Because now, it works. Because, because it works, that's right. right. And in my own studies of this, it's pretty clear that people, when they make a professor level, the full professor level, continue at the same rate. It's people stop publishing once they get tenure. In fact, respects, tenure represents a situation which is actually riskier for the professor than finance. Because basically, because under the five-year contracts, there is a decision for tenure where you're firing half your people. And you know, at top unit, half the people get cut at you know the tenure point, and, and at really top universities, it can be three quarters, uh, ninety percent. At at Harvard, uh, there used to be a statement uh, uh, about assistant for treat assistant professor someone who's got a terminal illness with great sympathy, but you don't expect them to be uh, so hard to make that next step. Whereas if you've got a five-year contract, they give you a job, it's like, oh, you're five years for doing it. In many, our instructors uh, are, in a sense, under much less pr pressure than going up for tenure. Going up for tenure, you recognize that a lot of them are going to get cut, whereas as long as an instructor does a decent uh, year after year, as long as enrollment. Well, it depends on the uh, uh, university, because it might be, uh, for example, the university of faculty, yeah. Uh, okay. If you want to be from an assistant to associate, or you just want five years to stay with that, it's an exam requirement. Well, uh, at a place in New England, you cannot have the same growth that we do. So, so we need, we can't just get, because we need the with enrollment growth, the area where enrollment growth, suddenly a difference in terms of your attitudes towards keeping people around. 